with the folks this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning with verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, what is unseen is eternal. This is the one. I want to welcome everyone here. It's good to see you on. Thank you for being here. Absolutely. So it is. If this is your first time, let me say, and I'm glad you're here. I know that there's a lot of brokenness in this world. And I know that there's a lot of folks going through a lot of things right now. And my prayer is that we won't take for granted this opportunity to hear the word of the Lord. So I can tell you this right now. If you're hurting Know that you're in the presence of God right now. Not because of the sermon that's about to come out of my mouth, not because of anything else except the fact that God's love is you. And in that, His love restores life. This morning, we're going to discuss a couple of spiritual truths that are sometimes humanly hard to accept. Here's one of them right here. Jesus is not a one-and-done process. Let's go ahead and understand that. Can I get an amen? amen? A lot of times in our culture, we are used to instant gratification. We are used to one-and-done. And a lot of times we think, man, I just need to get Jesus. I need him to shake his hand, say the, the prayers I'm supposed to pray, say, you're the Lord of my life, and then think, okay, good. Now I got you in my back pocket. I'll let you know if I need you. That's not how the Jesus thing works. Second of all, Jesus is not an accessory to your life. Right? Sometimes it depends on where we are, whether we bring Jesus out and show him. What church do you go to? Ah, I go to the refuge. See, I know Jesus. But if we're hanging out with people that won't, don't want to talk about Jesus, we quietly put him up. You see, we think sometimes that Jesus is here to benefit our life. When the truth is, we're here to give up our life and follow him. Now let me ask you this question. Can anybody in here be honest and say that's a lot easier said than done? Absolutely. Know this, Jesus is a relational journey. A relational journey, developing true life as you go. <clears throat> See, a lot of times we go to Jesus and we say, hey, my life is messed up. Fix it. Here's what I want. And I appreciate it. But God says, no, give me your life and then just start following me. <clears throat> so that we may journey together. We may spend time together. And a lot of us in this room would say, Jesus, where are we going? before we start. And Jesus may say, we're going to go in a circle. Well, Jesus said, you go in a circle, we're never going to get anywhere. Jesus says, no, you don't get it. It's the journey that changes you, not the destination. In fact, Jesus is the destination. So this morning, we need to really grasp that there is a deeper life that God has for you in me. A life that I promise you, no matter how good you can think, it doesn't compare to the life that God has for you. Because let's be honest, if God was to come to us and say, how would you like me to build your life? A lot of our answers would be out of selfish motive. Can I get an amen? We would say, this is what I think is best for me. Many of us in this room have lived our lives according to what we think is best for us, only to find out, huh, it really wasn't best for us. In fact, it was completely destructive. So there has to be a different way of life. 
Everybody on this planet is searching for it. Oh, and some people declare that they have found it. And they love to create advertisements that say, I have found it. And if you order now, <laughs> you too can have it. Listen to this. This is very important. The life that Christ gives is free. But it will cost you everything you are. Has having to be free and costly. You don't have the ability to pay for this life. It is freely given, but it will change everything that you are. If you truly follow it, if you truly give it into it. Um, my son has started to play varsity football. My son is a sophomore, and he's a grown man which is very frustrating to a dad. Because I used to pick my son up and hug him. Now, as a 16-year-old, he picks me up and hugs me. He'll hurt me every now and then. <laughs> but he's having to learn something. That when you play at that level, you can't halfway do it. You can't. And he's a lineman. He plays tack on the left and the blind side. So they usually have the, the best pass rusher on his side. And there's times when he wasn't prepared and he gets level. But he gets back up. And he doesn't go to coach and say, I quit. I can't do this anymore. I don't like it. No, he says, I'm going to learn from that. But I have learned I cannot go halfway. I have to go all out. A lot of us, we like to go halfway to Jesus. I will give you this, Jesus. Stay away from this. I like this. But Jesus says, but that's killing you. If you give it to me, I will give you full and joyful life. Like I said, it's a lot easier said than done. This morning, we're going to be in Mark chapter 8, verses 22 through 34. In these scriptures, there's four small moments that Jesus goes through with people as well as his disciples that can teach us just the basics of this journey. But know this, everybody's journey is their own. Can I get an amen? Yes. God is not in the business of making cookie cutter people, especially when he has purposely made you the way that you are. Some of you in this room are extremely stubborn and bullheaded. <laughs> Only a few of you are not. <laughs> God makes you that way for a reason. We've been stubborn and bullheaded for the destruction part of our lives. Imagine if we'd be stubborn and bullheaded for the things that give us life. Amen. Absolutely. But this morning, don't take for granted that this journey has a similar process for all of us, even though each journey is our own. Let me pray for us real quick. Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you for the scriptures that we are about to hear. Father, I pray that your spirit would speak to each and every one of our hearts. Father, that you give us the boldness to apply this scripture to our hearts today so that we may leave here being about our Father's business. Father, I do pray for those this morning that are struggling, that are hurting. Lord, they need your love. I pray that you pour out your spirit upon us. Heal those things that hurt us. But Father, also give us the instruction so that we may be obedient. Do all you have in mind, in Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen. Amen. The first story, Mark chapter 8, starting in 22, is a blind man healed at Bethsaida. It says, Then Jesus came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to Jesus and begged Jesus to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And the man looked up and said this, I see men like trees walking. 
Then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up, and he was restored, and the man saw everything clearly. Then he sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into the town, nor tell anyone in the town. Real quick moment with Jesus. The first thing we need to look at at this is that Jesus intends to be personal. They brought the blind man to Jesus and said, hey, he needs you, Jesus. He's blind. Now show us how you heal him. And people gather around to see this happen. And what does Jesus do? He takes the man and leads him out of town. To where it's just him and Jesus. Our culture loves to follow the masses. We do. Maybe a lot of you here don't. <laughs> Which is a good thing. A lot of times in our life, we just want to be a part of the people of God. Instead of taking our time to walk with God individually. Jesus takes this blind man out of town. Now follow me here. He spits on his eyes. And says, do you see anything? And the guy looks up and says, I see men that look like trees walking around. And then Jesus touches the man's eyes again. And the man opens his eyes and can see clearly. Now, here's what my first thought was on this scripture. Did Jesus not do it well enough the first time that he had to re-wipe his eyes? No, I think there's something different, something deeper that happened. And Jesus told the blind man, look up, tell me what you see. And he looked up into heaven and saw men walking around like trees, things he didn't understand, things that were bold and gave life. And he saw something that was not of his world or understanding. Do you believe, ladies and gentlemen, that God has another way of being in another place for his children? A place that you and I really don't know anything about. We long for it. We want it. We'll, we'll go to every link to try to find it. But the only way that we can find it is we got to spend some personal time with Jesus, letting him from the soul. Can I get an amen? amen? Sometimes it's not preferred how he cleans us up. I don't think the blind man went, oh, thank you for spitting on my eyes. <laughs> I don't think he went, that felt good. In fact, I think the blind man went, did you just spit in my eyes? <laughs> He's like, shh, tell me what you see. <clears throat> and he was opened up. And then Jesus touched him again. He could see clearly. He has this face of Jesus in front of him. And I wonder if that blind man went, what was that I saw? And Jesus says, relax. There's more to it than you know. But today, don't tell anyone. <clears throat> Why did you not want me to tell someone? Let me ask you this question. Have you ever had that moment when you had good news or something great happen in your life to where you immediately want to call somebody and brag about it? Not for what has happened, but now look at me. Man, we do this a lot of times in our life. As much as we're saying we just want to share with others, the reality is we want to show how awesome we are. Listen to this. If Jesus does something wonderful in your life, he did it for you. It's between you and him, and he loves you and wants to restore your life. Don't tell others how awesome you are now. Tell others how awesome he is. That's the difference. As Jesus comes back, we get to the next moment. And this moment has to do with his disciples. I can imagine that Jesus showed up, and his disciples were like, hey, where's the blind guy? And Jesus says, what blind guy? <laughs> <laughs> all right, I won't say that one again. I'll put that one all right. He's not blind anymore. He sees, well, where is he? Why are you know, with you? Jesus says, between me and him, I'd sit him back home. And the disciples are with Jesus, and they begin to walk away and as they're walking. Verse 27 says this, Now Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi. 
And on the road, he asked his disciples, saying to him, Who do men say that I am? So they answered Jesus. Some said, Some say you're John the Baptist, others say you're Elijah, and still many say that you're just a prophet. He said to them, But who do you guys say I am? Then Peter, his disciple, answered him and said, I believe you're the Christ we have been looking for. I believe you're the Christ. Then Jesus strictly warned his disciples not to tell anyone about that. Think about this. You're walking with Jesus. Jesus asked a question. What do you think people think about me? You know, you notice that's not a question that we commonly ask others. Hey, what do people think about me? Well, you want the treat, you want me to lie to you. <laughs> lie to me first, you're awesome. <laughs> What's the truth? <laughs> Nobody likes you. <laughs> <clears throat> we don't like to ask that question because we're afraid of the response. And the reason why is, <clears throat> let me ask you this, are you still worried about what people think about you as a Christian? Because if your spiritual life with God is based on how people think about you, you will always be a spiritual yo-yo. Because there's a lot of Christian fags that come in and out. There's a lot of substitutions within the church agenda that does not explain Christ. But it's when you and I get alone with Christ where we come to that point to where we say, it doesn't matter what anybody else says, you are my Lord. That's when I believe you begin to sell out. You truly die in. Now there's going to be people that are always going to be naysayers. Can I get an amen? amen? People always talk bad about Jesus. They'll always talk bad about the church. Some people don't have a right to say it. Some people have a right to say it. But when it comes to who God is in your life, the question is, have you reached that point to where you no longer consider what people think about you? You don't even consider your own life. You know he is the cross. You only get there, ladies and gentlemen, if you have the scars. Here's what I mean by that. You have to get to a point where you die to self. Let me explain dying to self or denying self. It's, it's really difficult. So it's not a one and done thing like we talked about. I have to deny myself and what I want daily. And it usually happens in the least moments, right? I could be sitting there um, getting breakfast in the morning. I will take a donut. And I have a donut. And it's good. <laughs> and all is well with my soul. <laughs> and then something within me says, hey, where one is good, three are better. <laughs> And I'm like, glory to God. <laughs> but the Spirit tells me, you don't need those three donuts. And I say, shh. <laughs> but I want those three donuts. <laughs> and you start battling that stuff out. Maybe you're driving to work after denying the three donuts, praise the Lord. And somebody cuts you off. And you have every right by the state of Texas. <laughs> to give them some. <laughs> which is one of the habits that you have but as you go the Lord says stop deny yourself follow me let them through give them grace and forgiveness Lord I don't want to I'm not asking you if you want to I'm telling you to be obedient so that you don't find yourself bound by anger <laughs> that's working it out that's denying yourself on a regular basis <laughs> you get to that point where you are able to say, I don't care what my friends think, I don't care what my family thinks, but when I was broken, I was alone, and nobody else was there, your presence was there. I never felt alone because you were there always. That is the point where we start saying, I don't care what anybody says, you're my God. Not because of somebody debating it and proving it by words, but because when you were there. You restored me. And I love that part. Know that when you come to Jesus, He heals you. 
then you come to this realization that he's Christ. And then that's a good thing, but then this is where everything kind of starts to change. These disciples would have this wonderful moment with Jesus where Jesus declared to them, yes, I am the Christ, I'm going to restore, I am the one that's going to make everything new. I'm the one that is going to make things wonderful for you. And they're excited. Yes, ha ha, he's the Christ. Here we go. He's going to overthrow Rome. He's going to overthrow our, our, the way the world is today. And then he's going to become king. And we're going to get the benefits of him being king, right? They have their own ideas of what this looks like. And then Jesus begins to say this. Verse 31. And Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. He spoke this word openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke Jesus. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, saying, For you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. Notice what happens. Jesus begins to tell them, Yes, I'm going to restore your life. I'm going to make this happen. It's going to be awesome, and this is how it's going to be. I'm going to get rejected by your people. And they're going to kill me. But don't worry about it because in three days I'll rise again. And the men, the disciples were like, wait a second, that's not good. You're not supposed to be killed by them. You're supposed to kill them and reinstate us. And Jesus says, no, 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 you don't get it. This is awesome. It's even better. Once again, your people are going to reject me, and they're going to kill me. But don't worry. I'll raise again in three days. The disciples are hearing Jesus speak of a new way, a different way, a way that's not familiar to them. And this new way is a difficult way according to how they live. Kind of like you and me. We give our lives over to Jesus. We say, Lord, take control. He begins to work in us, and then we get uncomfortable. Can I get an amen? amen. Think about it. It becomes uncomfortable because we have to transition in this journey from the way we used to live to the way God wants us to live. And that journey is difficult. And right now, they're having a problem. Jesus says, don't worry, I'm going to die, but I'm going to raise again in three days after that. And the disciples, I believe, started to murmur. And that's not right. He's supposed to kill them and overthrow them. And then Peter, the man, the rock says, don't worry, guys. I'll talk to Jesus. I'll get this straightened out. Hey, Jesus, can I talk for a second? You and me over here. <laughs> Jesus goes, oh, what's going on, Peter? Hey, I don't think it's very smart for you to talk about being killed and stuff around the guys. Because here's the truth, Jesus. I'm here. I'm not going to let them kill you. I'll die before they kill you. And Jesus looks back at his disciples and sees them. He looks at Peter. He said, get behind me, Satan. You don't even know what you're talking about. You have no idea about the things of God because you keep looking at the things of man. And I believe that Peter was like, Whoa, I'm here to help. No, you're not helping. I don't need you to get in the way. I need you to get out of the way. You see, Jesus called him Satan. Understand this, ladies and gentlemen. As good as we think we are at controlling our own lives, God does not need our help. He needs our surrender. And when we surrender, that life begins to be restored. Notice what Jesus said. Jesus did not tell Peter, say, get away from me. He said, get behind me. I'm to lead you. You are not to lead me. In fact, what he did is he put Peter in his place. Basically by saying, who do you think you're talking to? Who do you think I am? That you think that you can absolutely control where I'm going? This is things of the Father, not of me. Well, we can understand that in our lives today, ladies and gentlemen. Have you ever had one of those moments you felt God telling you to do something, and by God, you didn't want to do it? I've never read in all the scriptures, and I've looked. 
where God took into consideration our feelings. <laughs> Forgive those if you feel like it. Don't sin unless you really want to. Don't run in church. <laughs> Welcome to Refuge, <laughs> By the way, I just want to say something about that little boy right there. That's an answer for prayer. Right? Amen. We've been that boy for a while. If he runs through here, you've got to keep praying for him. <laughs> <laughs> Hear me on this. Oh, I talk. Hear me on this. If we truly believe that He's our Savior, if we truly believe that, we truly give our life over. Please understand that it's going to be difficult as you go, but He's faithful. And He will see you through. Scripture tells us that what He's begun in your life, He's faithful to complete. It doesn't say that it's going to tickle. It doesn't say that it's going to be easy. In fact, Scripture tells us that narrow is the gate. And it's only those who truly seek after Him that will find it. We need to get in the habit of seeking Jesus personally and encouraging one another to do the same. We must not get in the way of Jesus, but must surrender our lives and let Him do His thing. Now, this is a very important scripture. This is not a scripture that you're going to hear and go, I feel better. This is verse 34. This is when Jesus called the people to himself with his disciples also. He said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit if a man gains the entire world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father, with the holy angels. Jesus just gave them where the rubber meets the road. If you want to be of me, you must deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. Here's what I believe he means by picking up your cross. You and God have done business. You know the things that need to be changed in your life. God tells you these things. And what do we do? And this is me. Maybe you don't. I do this. When God says, Travis, I don't need you to go see that movie because it's going to affect you in a certain way. And I go, oh, man, but what about him? How did he just go see it? You should see that movie. God said, hey, I'm not worried about him. That's true, me and him. I'm talking about you. Travis, I don't need you to go do this. I don't need you to go do that because I know you. That's picking up your cross and following him. Man, I've had one of those moments in my life where all my friends were going to do something, and I was excited to go, but in my spirit I felt God saying, you're not going. And me and God had a fight. I mean, a real how dare you? That's unfair. Why can't I go have fun? Why is this blah, 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 blah? And the Lord was just telling me, listen, this is my will for you. And I was like, your will for me is for me not to have fun in my life? I was like, no. I know who you are. And I know how it will affect you. And it will come between us. And so I didn't go with my friends. I wish I could tell you that they all got in trouble, got arrested. <laughs> and then I was able to stand there and go, that's right! <laughs> nope, they had a blast. I kept hearing that you should have been there stories. And I'm just looking at God like, ha 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 ha. But 
But there's something about that. I had to trust that. I had to pick up my cross. I had to follow him, not me. I had to follow him, not church. I had to follow him, not what it says on the news. I had to follow him. I had to pick up my cross. Because it's a journey between me and him. Now, I wish I could tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that once you do that one time, everything gets better in life. No, we have to learn daily to get rid of our will, accept God's, and follow his. Some days it's easy and great. Some days it's really difficult. But if we keep doing it, and we keep doing it day after day, deny self, pick up your cross, follow him. Deny self, pick up your cross, follow him. For me, sometimes it's moment by moment. But eventually you get used to living that way. And then all of a sudden, scales will fall from our eyes. We'll start seeing life in a new way. We'll start experiencing peace that the world does not understand because it's the peace that surpasses all understanding. It won't be here that we'll know God. It'll be here that we know God. And that's when things get restored. In fact, the next thing that happens, we're not going to read this scripture, <laughs> But when we learn to battle every day, something happens. The next thing that happened the next day is Jesus got up. He went to his three closest disciples and said, come follow me. And they got up and followed Jesus. In my opinion, they finally got to that point where they no longer questioned Jesus. The day they first followed Jesus, that when Jesus would say, come follow me, they'd say, where are we going? How are we going to get there? What time will we be back? Had all these words about what was going on. But the more you walk with Jesus, the more that you begin to understand whatever he says to do something, just do it. And he says, you three, come follow me. And they went, yes, sir. And they started walking up a mountain. Walking up a mountain. Walking up a mountain. They finally get to the top. And the disciples, I wonder if they're tired. That was a... Uh, that was a hike. We didn't have breakfast yet. <laughs> but we're going to follow you. Okay. And all of a sudden, they're standing there. The three of Jesus. Jesus begins to change right in front of them. His skin becomes white. His garment becomes washed. He becomes different in feature. He becomes powerful and strong to the point they start freaking out a little bit and Jesus turns around and walks off and as he walks off, here come two more individuals that the disciples recognize. One of them is Moses and one of them is Elijah and they're talking with Jesus who just changed his appearance right in front of us and he's now talking with them. Something is happening in their world and we get to see it. I wonder what they were talking about. They were talking about things of God that the world doesn't understand. Can you imagine that? That they got to see through the eyes of God. Ladies and gentlemen, when we fully surrender, recognize that He is the Christ, and we give ourselves to Him, and we get that pattern of giving ourselves every day to Him, I promise you, you'll start seeing life through the eyes of God. That's when you will have peace. That's when you will have peace. That's when you will have victory and restoration. As they walk down the mountain, it says they were scared. As they were scared, a cloud engulfed them. Listen to this. And a voice said to them, This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. And they were tripping out, thinking, that's the voice of God. We're dead. <laughs> <laughs> they say they know is Jesus is touching them. Are you guys okay? And they look up and it's Jesus. And I can imagine if I was one of those disciples, I'd be like, hold on a second. <laughs> what just happened? My mind is blown right now. And Jesus is like, well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I just want you to know that uh, there's a whole new world for you guys. Because I am the Christ. That's where I call you. That's where you are going. We must journey together to get there. And as they're walking down the mountain, Jesus does this. By the way, don't tell me about it. 
Oh, I'm wild now. <laughs> I can talk to a stop sign. <laughs> if you don't want me to say anything, if you say stop for everybody, get that from Jesus. So listen to this refuge. When we finally get to that point where we start seeing life through the ways of God's eyes, through the ways He does things, it was after He died and rose again, He fulfilled what He said He was going to do, that He told His disciples, Now, Go and tell people who I am by how you live. The world will know that you're my disciples by how well you love one another. And then he promises you this I will be with you all the way to the end. Ladies and gentlemen, hear me now. He is our Christ, He is our Savior. And if you're going through a hard time right now, keep going. Don't stop. If you've messed up and you feel like you can't get back up, let me tell you something. Jesus is not a God who sits there and when you fail, he looks at you and says you're worthless. No, he's a God that picks you up, dusts you off, heals you and says, you ready to keep going? Let's keep going. Let's say God can accomplish and do everything he desires in us. Let's stay together, Pastor Alan. Cited from the book of Ezekiel. Son of man, can these bones live? Prophesy to these bones. I, I will make bread dinner you, and you will come to life. Let's pray. Father God, we do love you. <coughs> Master, we recognize all that you have done. Master, for us, God, as you have made a way straight. Master, we thank you that you have given us the secrets of life. That you are the Son of God. That you died in our place. That we might live through and for you. So today, God, we surrender to that. Surrender to that. Breathe into these dry bones that we might live. That we might celebrate who you are and what you're doing, God, in this place amongst his people, and in this city. Let our voice be true to your voice. God, let our lives be a demonstration of your love. Cause us to be the hand of God to a lost and dying world. We thank you for that. God, bless this your people. Master, as they go from this place, as they go into this world, guide their path. Set a light before them. We trust you for that. We ask all this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. God bless you all.